All right, we're, uh, we're carrying on with Ephesians. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, Paul exhorts them to maintain the unity that is theirs in Christ. Not to create it, it is created already. Christ has affected this unity. He has brought Jew and Gentile into one body. Then in chapter 4, verse 7 through 16, he explains that there's diversity within that unity, which diversity includes ministers of the word who are given to the body by the ascended Christ to serve as catalysts for the body's growth. The body is to be built up in root to the complete maturity at the consummation so that it might progress in Christ's likeness, that it may increasingly grow out of the immaturity that makes it theologically vulnerable. So that's in 4, 7 through 16. Then in 4, 17 through 24, he tells them that they can no longer live as the Gentiles. Do you remember when I told you that the 4 through 6 is predominantly ethical uh, exhortation, how you're to live, and you see it so clearly there. He says, listen, uh, you must no longer live as you did, as the Gentiles do. These are Gentile Christians he's writing to. He says, listen, that's not part of Christianity. You don't bring the old life into it. You, you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, as those who've turned their backs on God, as those who no longer have an awareness of or a sensitivity to God. That's not to be you. That's how you were. Now you're a Christian. You used to be that way, but now you're a Christian. And things are completely different. They are to live new lives of righteousness and holiness. Okay, so if you say that that's my goal, that's what I'm I'm trying to do. I'm trying to live righteously. I'm trying to live a holy life. Are you afraid to say that? You know, if you say it, people say, oh, you think you're better than everybody else? No, I look, I'm trying to be a Christian. My goal is not to excel morally so I can look down on somebody. It is to be what Christ called me to be. And we have to take that seriously, and you'll see that more and more. And when we ended, we were looking at chapter 4, verse 25, through chapter 5, verse 2. And that's where I want to pick back up, and I will read that again. He says in 425, Therefore, having put off falsehood, let each one speak the truth with his neighbor... For we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your provoked state and do not give an opportunity to the devil. Let the one who steals, steal no longer. But rather let him labor doing with his own hands what is good so that he may have something to share with the person in need. Let no spoiled word proceed from your mouth but whatever is good for building up according to the need so that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and shouting and slander be removed from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. Be imitators of God, therefore, as beloved children, and walk in love. Just as Christ also loved us and gave himself up on our behalf, an offering and sacrifice to God resulting in a fragrant aroma. Their responsibility as Christians to put off the old man and to put on the new man, which he declared in chapter 4, verses 22 to 24, means that they are to put off falsehood and speak the truth to other members of the body. That's part of what that means. They are to put off falsehood and put on truth. They are to speak truthfully to other members. They must deal swiftly with their righteous anger. And I talked about that quite a bit last week. Presumably deal with it by speaking the truth to the person who provoked it, by going to the source and ironing that out. And they must do that lest the devil turn that anger into the sins of malice, resentment, and bitterness. Okay, even proper anger, even righteous anger, it is such a powerful emotion can be turned into sinful things of malice and bitterness and that kind of thing. Now then he says, those who stole, they're to put off. They're to put that off. They're to cease doing that. Okay, people who are stealing are to put that off, cease that conduct, and to put on the work of earning material things that they might have something to share with those in need. You know, I'm thinking, this idea of stealing, you, you sometimes you know, people just think, well, it's okay to steal. You know, I mean, I, I'm just taking it. You know, no effort, no work, you just steal from people who have stuff. And one of the things, if you've seen that movie, uh, Cinderella Man, 
I love that movie, by the way. It's, a, it's based on a true story of a boxer, James Braddock, a heavyweight fighter during the Depression. And one of the things I loved in that movie, where they had no money and they were just really struggling, and his little boy uh, takes something, and he takes him back to the store, and on the way there he stops with his son, and he looks down and he says, look, no matter how it gets, we don't steal. You see, we don't steal. And I just love that, you know, that, well, no, no, it's okay. Look, we don't have, it's hard. We don't steal. And he tells that boy that, and I just love that. But here, you see, instead of taking from others through the minimal effort of stealing, it doesn't take much to steal, right? I mean, somebody else has done the work to produce something to have it. You just go and swipe it. Okay, instead of doing that, they're to work diligently so as to be in a position to give to others. Work hard to be, so you have something, so you are then in a position to give to other people. So the contrast is between this ease of stealing stuff and the diligent labor in which you're to engage so as to, so as to have something to give to other people. Harold Honer, he notes in his commentary that working with one's hands, that he stresses here, quote, does not necessarily imply that only manual work is valid, but Paul is using this expression as the normal portrayal of hard work for gain. This is how you picture hard work for gain in that society. You're working with your hands. That's not the only way you can work hard to earn things. But that's what would resonate. That, would ha- that is how you would paint the contrast there between working hard for gain as opposed to gaining by stealing, which is minimal effort. Okay, so there to work... They're there to work hard, diligently. Why? So that you may have something you can then share with other people. Earning an honest living so as to have something to share with others is part of the good works for which we were created in Christ. That he talks about in chapter 2, verse 10. Do you see it that way? Do you see your labor, when you're out earning an honest living, working diligently? You know, that's why they call it work. A lot of times it's a drag. But you're out doing it so you can earn something to have to give to other people and to share. Do you see the nobility of that? Or do you think that, no, that's not religious. That's not serving Christ. That's not part of my Christian faith. That's just a job. No. No, see, that's part of, yeah, that's part of the good works that you're called to do is to earn an honest living. To have something that you're then in a position to share with other people. And then we have all the outlets where we say, okay, you know, we have as a congregation, listen, we have a a mechanism. We think that we have good works. We're a good outlet for that money that you've earned. We have good things to do. We help people hear the gospel. We help poor people. We're doing things that we think Christ is, ah. See, so you have to give to that. So don't look at your work. That's just, quote, secular work. It is part of the, what Christ has called you to, to work diligently that you may have something to share with other people. He says, no spoiled or rotten word is to proceed from their mouths, which probably means a word that's harmful. Okay, it probably means a word that is harmful. It's often translated in this context as a foul word or an unwholesome word or an evil word or a corrupt word. But it means this idea of something that's spoiled or rotten. Okay, and so something that is harmful to somebody, instead of that, they're to speak words that build others up according to their needs, that they're doing so may be a blessing, may be a giving of grace to those who hear. Have you received that kind of thing? I mean, it's like a breath of fresh air. It's like a drink of water when you're parched. When somebody, you know, conveys the grace of God to you with a Good word, a kind word, an encouraging word, an uplifting word, instead of something that is detrimental and harmful and slashing and tearing down. That's a bummer. Not even if, not even if it's about you and about anybody. It's just like you're going, uh. But see, there is a way to bless people's lives with words. Okay, I'm not talking about flattering people for gain. I'm talking about sincerely speaking to people blessings, good things, encouraging things, things that are beneficial, things that build them up according to their needs. And we have the ability to do that. We need, and he tells them, he's telling these guys, you need to do this. Instead of saying things to people that are harmful and detrimental to them, 
You put that off. That's how the old man lived. You put on speaking blessings to them. Building them up according to their needs. Would that revolutionize any congregation if everybody got hold of that? My opinion is it would. Instead of, you know, chatter and this this kind of tearing down, if people spoke what was beneficial for building people up, I think it would revolutionize things. And he tells them, the Spirit of God tells them, this is how you're to be. Now, what do we do with it? God speaks to us as plain as the nose on my face, and that's plain, and he says, listen, this is how you're to be. And we just kind of sit there and go, okay, I hear it, I hear it, I hear it. What, what, does, what does it take for that word to transform the community? You see, what does it take for that word to transform the community? Paul says it to them through the Spirit and speaks to us today through what he said to them. Now, they're commanded not to grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom they were sealed for the day of redemption. And the Spirit is grieved. He's grieved by any kind of rebellion or disobedience. Okay, that grieves the Spirit. But I think especially he's, here he's focusing on those sins that cause division and corrupt you know, they cause division and they corrupt or, or disrupt communal life. Sins that break or mar the unity of the Spirit that he talked about in chapter 4, verse 3. He says, you are to maintain the unity which is a spiritual fact because Christ has created one body out of the two. He has bridged these fundamental divisions of mankind. Okay, these strata of society. Where people are thinking, listen, I'm here in this level, I don't associate with these, 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 these. All of these different ways that society stratifies. He has come and bridged all that and made one body. He has affected that unification through his death and resurrection. So that is something he has done. He calls them to maintain that, that unity that is a spiritual fact, not to mar it. Okay, and here when he's talking about these sins, I think that's what he's focusing on, Don't, not to grieve the Holy Spirit in a way of sins that cause division and disrupt communal life. These preceding sins that he's talked about, of not speaking the truth to one another. So he urges them, speak the truth to one another. Okay, those kinds of things, of not speaking the truth to one another, harboring anger, stealing and destructive comments, they all qualify as the kinds of things that would mar the unity of the Spirit. Right? Those are all things that create, what, resentment? Hostility? Disrupting the peace of the community. And we just don't talk a whole lot about it. But it's crucial. And so he says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. And he's talking about these kinds of things. And we just don't seem to care that much about it. We tolerate so much within our group of this kind of bickering and cutting down. And why doesn't somebody get offended and say, why are you doing that? Why are you speaking that way? Why are you trying to make me think ill of these folks? I don't know. But I think he's focusing on these kinds of sins. And the following commands, they also relate to this general command not to grieve the Holy Spirit. Bitterness? Well, you know, bitterness, right? Does that ever exist in congregations? Where you've got one, a group, like the Hatfields and the McCoys. Right? You've got in the body of Christ, you've got a pocket of people. Oh, we can't stand those folks. He said, well, what do you, you, you understand that you're all one body? Okay, so he talks about bitterness, wrath. We just furious with people. Anger, shouting. You know, you, where, where the, the hostility has gotten to the point, you got a shouting match. Remember when Jerry Houston was here? I'd never heard this, but I think he pretty much uh, won the prize when he's talking about division there. One of the elders bringing a gun. <laughs> yeah. I was about to fall over. I said, what's this guy doing? He's bringing a gun to church or a knife and threatening Jerry with it. I'm thinking, this guy's so far out of the loop, and there he is serving as an elder. I'm thinking, you know, Scotty, beam me up. This is like insanity. But you see this idea of shouting where, where the hostility is to that point. Slander. Just running people down, right? 
You're over here talking about this person. You, oh, did you hear about this person? Well, he's doing this stuff. And this person, what's this person do? This person then thinks, oh, this person's horrible. I don't want anything to do with that person. What does that do to the unity of the spirit? It fragments the body. And so he's telling them here, he says, listen, part of this new man that you're to put on, bitterness, wrath, anger, shouting, slander, and malice, all gone. These things disrupt the communal peace and they represent a failure to maintain the unity of the spirit that he talked about in chapter 4, verse 3. Got to go. Have to be gone. Must be taken seriously. And it, there, there just, it seems there is, there's a category of sins that are harder for us to get our grip on and to take seriously. And to think, how am I going to stop my participation in this? How am I going to do that? Okay? See, see, it, it's easy when you're talking about drunkenness. You say, okay, I know how to do that. I just give it the boot, fight it, understand it. These things are more subtle than that. But they are no less clear that they are contrary to the will of God and the body of Christ. On the other hand, you, you see, the unity of the Spirit is maintained. So he talks about those things. Well, what's the thing about putting on? Well, the unity is maintained by being kind. Doesn't, it, doesn't that glue the body together when you're kind toward other people? What does that? That brings people together. When you're compassionate toward people, their plight, their situation, where you're not looking for the first failure on somebody's part to say, ah, you see that? I knew you were a chump. No, you, you try to put yourself there and you have some compassion on people. Well, what does that do for the body? It draws people together. It cements the body. Okay, this idea of kindness, compassion, and forgiving, being forgiving to one another. Well, that's necessary, right? That's the key. Because if I'm, you know, if I'm offended, you've, you've done something to me, and I'm then going to let this sit here as a barrier, we've got to reconcile. We've got to come to some kind of harmony here. And that comes about through forgiveness. And he tells them to do it. I don't understand. He said, I'm, I'm just not going to do it. No, no, you, you can talk to me. You can talk to me about that. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to forgive anybody. No. I think it was Wesley. Somebody said to Wesley, he was talking about... Uh, forgiving. And the guy said, I don't believe in forgiving. And Wesley said, well, sir, then I hope you never sin. You see, because if you don't believe in forgiving, you're not going to be forgiven. But he's telling this group of people as diverse, as different. He says, listen, you need to be forgiving to one another. Now, regarding forgiveness, he reminds them that that's no more than what God has already done for them in Christ. He's asking them to forgive. How can I forgive? That's no more than what God has already done for you in Christ. So he casts the unforgiver clearly in the position of the unmerciful servant in Matthew 18. Right? We know the story. This guy, he gets, you know, he's forgiven. His debt's forgiven. He's great. He goes over here and throttles this guy that owes him pennies. Now, when we read that, we say, oh, man, what a, that's horrible for some. And that's the point. You have been forgiven. You have been forgiven tremendous amount. Your offense against God is huge because of who he is. The offense somebody does against you is petty in comparison. How can you receive the forgiveness of God and turn around to other people and say, I'm not going to forgive you? You can't. The new person can't. You don't even say, oh, I don't want to really forgive. Okay, well, I don't care what you want to do. You need to forgive people. And he's saying it to them, and the Spirit of God says it to us. We need to forgive people. That's what God has done for us in Christ. In some, they are as God's beloved children. In verse, he sits here and says, be imitators of God in, in 5.1. Therefore, as beloved children, and walk in love. Okay, and walk in love. They're to be imitators as his beloved children, imitators of him specifically with regard to loving one another. How are you to be imitators of God? In this context, it is specifically with regard to loving one another. 
Well, isn't that important? How do we do that? How do we increase that? How do we put that into practice? How do we love one another in the body of Christ? We better figure it out because he's saying it to them. You be imitators of God specifically with regard to loving one another. The model and ground for this life of love in the Christian community is Christ's love and his sacrificial offering of himself. That's the model. That's the ground. Now, when you said yes to Jesus Christ, you came in, right? Well, okay, here it is. He's calling you. I I know you may not want to do that. I understand that. The cross wasn't comfortable for me. Come on. I'm calling you. You are to forgive and you are to love and you are to do it sacrificially and you are to bless the members of the body of Christ. And you tell me that if the church lived that and reflected that, that the world wouldn't say, what what is going on with these people? You see, that's how the church was seen in the early centuries. You know, you you can read writings you know, post-apostolic writings of how the church was, how radical it was in its selflessness, in its giving to one another, in its taking care of widows, you know, people fasting two days a week so they would have something to share with other people. You see, it has to be a radical transformation that will affect people and it will draw people. As long as people think that you're a social club that's playing religion, it has no appeal to them. It's like, listen, there are plenty of social clubs in the world. What do I care about this? But when they see that this is something, a radical work of God, ooh, I think it draws them. In fact, I know it draws them. Well, here's how O'Brien summarized. He says, the apostle's point is plain. Christ Handing himself over to death for his people was the supreme demonstration of his love for them. Because he is both the ground and model of their love, costly sacrificial love is to be the distinguishing mark of their lives. To serve others in this way is not only to please God, it is also to imitate both God and Christ. That's what we want, right? This stuff gets scary, I know that. You see, I know that. But that's the whole thing about the call of Christianity. You cannot domesticate it. You cannot put it in a cage and say, good little boy. It comes in and just transforms everything. You see, the Spirit of God revolutionizes your life. And this is where the rubber meets the road. Some of these things are easy. These external things are easy. You know, getting rid of some of it. But these kinds of things of sacrificial love for one another... Well, I don't particularly like the person. Love the person. Act for their welfare. Seek their best interests. Sacrifice yourself for their good. The body of Christ. He calls them to do that, and he calls us to do that. Chapter 5, verse 3 through 14. But do not let sexual immorality and any impurity or greed even be named among you, as is fitting for saints nor obscene speech, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are, out of, which are not proper, but rather thanksgiving. For this you must know for sure. No sexually immoral or impure or greedy person who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes on the sons of disobedience." Therefore, do not be sharers with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Ascertaining what is pleasing to the Lord. And do not participate in the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather even expose them. For it is shameful even to mention the things being done by them in secret. But everything exposed is made visible by the light, for everything that makes visible is light. Therefore it says, awake sleeping one and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Paul goes on here and he says, look, they are to live in love, as he said 
he just finished emphasizing this idea of love. You're to be loving of one another. They are to live in love, but that's a self, you know, that, that's a, a self-giving, sacrificial love. There's absolutely no place in the Christian life for illicit or impure love. See, it's easy to, to blur these things. He's talking about there to love. He's not talking about self-indulgent sensuality. That's not what he means. He means sacrificing for the welfare of another person. Committed to that person's good. That's love. You know it with your kids, right? You know, you're not always just, joy, you know, just enraptured with what they're doing. You know, you, sit or you, you get agitated, but there is a deeper thing at work there that says, I am committed to the welfare of that child and would die for that child. What I do, even when the kid hates me for it, is to bless the child. That's love. He said, I'm not talking about this self-centered, self-indulgent sensuality. Paul says it's sexual immorality, any impurity and greed, which you could translate covetousness, they're not even to be named among them. Okay, now with the NIV, the TNIV, the English Standard Version, I take porneia here, this word, as sexual immorality. Okay, a very broad term because as Ernest Best says in his commentary, he says, the word has a wide range of meanings in relation to sexual behavior, including fornication, adultery, homosexuality, prostitution, incest. Fornication is therefore too narrow a definition. Okay, that's why you see in these translations this, this broader sense of sexual immorality to cover this, the waterfront okay, on these things. Impurity is associated with sexual immorality, not just here in 2 Corinthians 12, 21, Galatians 5, 19, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3 and verse 7, Colossians 3, 5. So you have impurity and sexual immorality uh, often linked, and I think in this context its focus is on unrestrained sexual behavior. Paul includes it with sexual immorality to cover the broadest possible spectrum of sexual misconduct. Okay? He's covering the waterfront of sexual misconduct. And he says, that's not part of you. I understand Gentile world of the first century. I understand what goes on. You know, I'm not, oh, I don't know. Oh, I understand what goes on. And I'm telling you, that's got to go, and you put on this new person that doesn't participate in that. I know how the I know they're all sitting there saying, oh, that's just stupid, you're really missing out. Oh, that's crazy. Oh, you're part of that religion that thinks that. Oh. All right, he understands that, but he says all of this stuff is to go. Even greed probably here has sexual connotations. But even greed probably has that, referring to an excessive desire for self-gratification. Okay, sexual immorality, impurity, and greed. The Tenth Commandment, it prohibits coveting a neighbor's wife. Okay, coveting a neighbor's wife in several uh, Jewish writings, they combine the ideas of covetousness and sexual immorality. So you see this link here, and you have uh, the cognate verb for, for sexual immorality in 1 Thessalonians 4, 6. It has sexual connotations. In Ephesians 4.19, the word is used in the sense of being greedy for impurity, where the NIV translates it with a continual lust for more. Okay, so I think all of these things are after, these three terms are grouped together. They're after this idea of, of improper sexual activity, and he says that these sins are not even to be named among them. Okay, that means one of two things, at least one or two things that I know about. Okay, it means either that there shouldn't even occur one time. There should be no instances of this kind of stuff among you as Christians. That's true. Or, and I think this is probably more likely, it means that, they, that these kinds of things should not become acceptable subjects of conversation. Okay, that they shouldn't become acceptable subjects of conversation. Now, in support of that view, you get chapter 5, verse 12, where he says it's shameful even to speak of the things being done in secret by the disobedient. So there's some idea of actually talking about these things. You see, casual discussion, as Andrew Lincoln says in his commentary, casual discussion of sexual sins creates an atmosphere in which they're tolerated and which can indirectly even promote their practice. You see? 
When you start just this casual conversation where it loses any sense of, whoa, what are you talking about? And you just start talking about sexual sins and it becomes acceptable, casual conversation. It leads to and can lead to promoting the actual practice. Paul obviously doesn't mean here that you cannot identify the sin to rebuke it and teach against it. That's what he's doing. Okay, that's not what he's talking about. He means, as F.F. Bruce says, such unholy things should not be acceptable subjects of conversation among people whom God has called to be holy. Now, if that strikes you as an odd idea, let me suggest to you, I think the world understands this idea very well. Okay, the world understands this idea, this principle, very well, that mainstreaming talk about sexual sin reduces resistance to it. When you just make it just an everyday talk and conversation, you wind up reducing resistance to it. That was part of the strategy, by the way, of homosexual activists to promote acceptance of their sinful conduct within our society. Let me quote to you a couple of homosexual political strategists who wrote in 1987, they wrote an article named Marshall Kirk and Hunter Madsen. In 1987, they wrote an article titled The Overhauling of Straight America. And two years later, they published a book titled After the Ball. And they laid out a six-point strategy for changing America's perception of homosexual behavior. And number one on that list was, quote, uh, number one was, quote, talk about gays and gayness as loudly and as often as possible, end quote. And they state, quote, this is the two homosexual political strategists in the 80s, they say, quote, the principle behind this advice is simple. Almost all behavior begins to look normal if you are exposed to it enough at, a clo at close quarters and among your acquaintances, end quote. See, so I mean, don't tell me, you know, the world understands this principle. That if you simply become casual and you lose a sense of that is ugly and offensive, you lose a sense of that, okay. Why do you think, listen, you know, people could call me paranoid, but I think there's a spiritual war going on, okay? Now, why do you think every television show you turn on is selling this to you? Oh, it's just wonderful. It's the greatest thing in the world. Here it is. You know, as soon as you see somebody, I'll tell you, you see somebody in a show or a movie, if he's got a Bible, you can be sure he's going to be a nut. He's going to be a nut. He's going to be a pedophile. There's going to be something wrong with him. He's going to be overbearing on his children. He's going to be a screwball in some way, shape, or form. He will not be healthy. And if you see somebody else who's, you know, two guys living together, they're going to be stars. Okay, now you think, it's, you think that it is, it is coincidence that this is being fed to you nonstop and to your children so that they then grow up and look at you and think that there's something wrong with you because you think that what God calls sinful is sinful? Oh, you're just not with it. I can't believe that. You're bigoted. No, I'm a Christian and I know what sin is. And I don't care if the whole world sits here and goes, there. you want to start telling me this stuff is right? I can read. I know that. I, I, I can read and I can also think about other things and see. All right, so you see this. The world knows this and Paul is telling these Christians, don't let this become just casual conversation among you. Because it reduces the resistance to sin, and I think that's his point. Now, he strongly, he strongly urges them. And he says, you've got this idea. Then he says also, nor is there to be, or is there their conversation to, to contain obscene speech, foolish talk, or coarse joking. These things are not proper in the life of a Christian. Obscene speech, you know what? You're just talking dirty. You're just talking dirty. You know, you hear people say, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. You listen to them, and it's, you know, all of these. <laughs> Do you not understand that that's not right? Oh, it's no big deal. Are you hung up on that? No, I'm trying to live right, and so should you be. It's not some small thing that you just sit here and talk, as I would say, like a drunken sailor. No offense, sailors. Uh, but it's an idiom. I know where it came from, too. Uh, but, you know, I mean, that's not, that's not in keeping with Christianity. Foolish talk is more general. Okay, it's unrestrained or unguarded speech such as that of a drunken person. And in this context, it probably refers to talk about sex. 
Coarse joking refers here to the use of suggestive language and allusions to impure matters. O'Brien says all three terms refer to a dirty mind expressing itself in vulgar conversation. Now let me tell you something to young folks who are never in here. But listen, young people need to, in, in the church, need to get a handle on this. Because when you're young and coming up, you think it makes you sound grown up and big and tough to talk dirty. And you create a culture within the group that tolerates that kind of stuff. Christians, some of you need to stand up and say, that's wrong. And you'll put a stop to it. You see, as long as the culture tolerates it, oh yeah, yeah, it's just us talking, you know, we can just talk this way. Don't put up with it. Say to somebody, listen, I love you. That is not right. That is not holy. That is not how you talk. Okay, you watch what happens. But you don't want to do that, so you don't want to stand, oh, who do you think? Oh, you holy Joe? No, look, I'm a sinful person limping his way toward Christ's likeness. That's what I'm trying to do, but I can see that what you're doing is wrong. If you see what I'm doing is wrong, then you return the favor. But I'm not just going to sit here and turn my back on it and just sit here and, yeah, and it's all great, and have that right in my presence. I think it would go a long way. I think it would be very beneficial. Instead of these things, Christian speech should be characterized by thanksgiving to God. Okay, thanksgiving is the opposite of self-indulgent sensuality of the preceding verses. It's recognition and appreciate of God's generous giving. You see, that's how we're to be. We're not to be tied up in these other things. Now, Paul strongly warns him about the danger of practicing sexual sin. In verse 5, he says, For this you must know for sure. Okay, you must know for sure, no sexually immoral or impure or greedy person who is an idolater, and he's speaking about sexually impure, sexually greedy, has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. He flatly declares. Right? I mean, isn't that pretty clear? He flatly declares that. There is going to be no participation in the kingdom of God, the consummated kingdom, for those who live impenitently like this. He says the same thing in Galatians chapter 5, 19 to 21, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. You can't just sit here and thumb God in the eye, treat these sexual sins as they don't matter. I'm going to live however I want to live. I don't care. And then turn around and say, oh Lord, you must repent of these things. This just isn't that difficult. I mean, it may be to do it, but I mean to understand what he's saying. And we, we talk about, well, you know, when you're, when you're sharing with somebody, should you talk to them about, well, if they're living with somebody, if they're living with somebody and not married, got to repent. Right? I don't get it. Okay, you say, well, why is it? Well, that's being mean. It's not being mean. It is trying to bless their lives because if you want to feed them a falsehood, what's going to happen? They're going to sit here and bop along and say, no, this is okay. Uh, the religious guy I know told me it was okay. Now, what's going to happen when he comes up and says, well, what does Paul say? The Spirit of God through Paul says, of this you can be sure, you must know for sure, no sexually immoral, impure, impure, greedy person has an inheritance. You must repent of this. It's serious. If you're sleeping with somebody, having sexual relations with somebody, and you are not married to them, you must stop it. I can't say it any clearer than that. I'm not going to stop it. I'm not going to listen to that guy. Look, I'm trying to help you. Okay? I don't get points for it. I'm trying to help you. I can read. You need to stop it. And I don't care how long it's gone on. You need to say, listen, cut and go to the Lord and say, forgive me. And I'm putting this behind me. He can say this to these Gentiles there. He's saying it to us here. Okay, and we live in a culture, like I say, we teach everybody growing up, especially young people, I understand the power of hormones and all that stuff. But we live in a culture that's so immersed in this that says, listen, you can't live without this. And I'm telling you, you're going to have to. You get married. And sex is, you know, in there, blessed, holy, right, good. Christians are, you know, that's the caricature of Christians. Oh, sex. Oh, I don't know. 
See, that's part of the enemy's deal. That's, all, that's why they talk about this stuff. You see, they're really all hung up. They're really hung up, you see. Well, that's baloney. It's that we can read. Okay, and I see what God is saying. All right, so he, he talks about that and he says, he says flatly, uh, you know, greed is the excessive desire for something. In this case, sexual experiences. It's a form of idolatry because it elevates the desired thing over God. It is an idolatrous obsession. And that's what I would say to you. If you are engaging in this and you hear me today, if you've never read this, you hear me pointing this out to you and saying this to you, check it, read it. And you wind up saying, that's too bad. I'm going to continue in it. Now, you tell me that's not idolatry. Aren't you putting that over God? Sure. That's why he calls it that. Okay, that's why he calls it that. Now, he urges them. Aha, well, he'll urge them next week, Lord willing. Thank you. <laughs> 